Okay. The recording has started and everyone is muted. Welcome. We did this webinar yesterday. As you know, we split it up into two pieces so that you didn't have to take everyone in your customer service departments offline at the same time. So I'm happy to see a number of you are here today. Remember now, today is the last one that we're doing yesterday and today with the two sessions. So after today's webinar, you should all have the information that you need to be on the same page and begin some great brainstorming discussions. So you can all get together with your teams, discuss, brainstorm, use the ideas. Is, that's the beauty of everyone having some of the same information. You can come to the table with a common premise and begin creating wow experiences for yourself and all your members. We have a lot to cover today, so I'm just going to dive right in. Now, one thing I want to start with is a few key customer service concepts and mindsets. And the first one is the age-old question of why do satisfied customers tell nine people or so about their great experience with you while dissatisfied customers tell 12 to 15 and 13 percent of them by the way will tell up to 20 people or more in person over the phone personally so that doesn't even take into account those who are telling 5,000 of their closest friends <laughs> all about their experience with you on social media and why is that why is it that people do that kind of thing well it's because our members expect to have a good experience with us so it is no surprise when it happens. In fact, that's the same with any organization at all. They hire you because they think that you're going to be able to do a good job for them. So what happens when it doesn't work out that way is it's a shock and that shock is what they start talking about. So what we have to do is remember that those strong experiences that they have when they are shocked like that produce strong emotional responses and it is difficult to forget events that cause strong emotional responses. And we can remember that if we can produce those strong emotional responses inadvertently with our experiences, then we can absolutely intentionally create strong emotional responses with our wow experiences that we craft and intentionally deliver. Because people simply can't help but talk about memorable events. It's human nature. Think about it. If you go on vacation and somebody asks you when you come back, how was the vacation? And you say, it was good. It was great. Sunshine. Oh yeah, it was wonderful. <laughs> Wow, who wants to hear that story, right? They want to hear the really great, wow, you wouldn't believe the sunsets we saw on the beach or the you wouldn't believe what happened to us kind of story. And those are the things to get passed around. And because of this trait of human nature, we have to remember that a merely good member experience is a death sentence because no one wants to talk about it. They won't be recommending you. Nothing happens when it's merely good. We have to create great or wow experiences, even if we think the person is unwowable. Now, here's one more mindset for you to remember. Customers are up to eight times more loyal after having a customer service issue re resolved with a wow than if they'd never had a problem at all. Now, this doesn't mean to go out and create problems so that then you can solve them and get them more loyal, but it does mean that the reason this happens is that when something goes wrong, as we all know it will, listen, we're all human, technology doesn't work right all the time, there are many, many things that can go wrong, and reasonable people understand that. But when they go wrong, how we react to it and how we treat our members in the process says more about us than anything that we can do when times are good. See, anybody can deliver a great experience when things go well, but it's when things go wrong, how we deliver the wows in that case that our people will remember much more than anything else. So remember, you have an opportunity to show who you are, to show what you're made of, when things go wrong. And I love this quote. It's by Horace. And now look, look at the years that he lived, 65 to 8 BC. 
And he says adversity has the effect of eliciting talents, which in prosperous circumstances would have lain dormant. Wow, look at that. This kind of thinking and mindset has been around forever. So we have to remember we can show our stuff and show what we're made of when there are difficult and challenging circumstances. So if we're going to create the wows, we have to look at what do our members really want. Well, in addition to the physical and business needs that they have, which are, you know, the product or the service that they've joined the co-op to get, they've hired us basically to deliver to us, then we have to remember the personal side. And what every human being on the planet wants, in addition to the physical and business needs, is to be valued, appreciated, and listened to. Think about that too. When you call someone, especially if something is wrong, what do you want? You want to know that that person values your business enough to take you seriously, to appreciate what you bring to the table for them so they can stay in business, and that you want to be listened to. You want to know that they're listening to what you have to say. That's what we want in any given situation. And we can never assume that just because they're receiving the physical or business needs of the product or service, that we're actually making them feel valued, appreciated, and listened to. So watch for every opportunity to thank your member, to show them that you care, to make sure that you over deliver on everything that you give to them. And that is how we create wow experiences. But Contrary to popular belief, creating the wow is not all about the big flashy one-time actions that create fleeting impact and then are gone. No, it's about the small everyday actions that we take to create lasting impressions on everyone we interact with. And we all know that it's what we do every single day to be the best that we can be and to bring out the best in everyone around us that even makes the big wows possible. So think about how you can create those wows by doing small things. In fact, I don't know if you've ever seen the 212 movie, but it is fantastic. If you haven't seen it, now it used to be at www.212movie.com. They moved it for a while, but it could be back. But even if you can't find it there, you can Google it or look on YouTube and I'm sure you will find it. But the premise of the movie is this. At 211 degrees, water is hot. But at 212, what happens? You're all probably thinking, you know what happens. It boils. And with boiling water comes steam. And steam can power a locomotive. All it takes is one extra degree. So apply that to your job and your circumstance now. What is the one extra degree of experience? The one extra degree of compassion? The one extra degree of action that you can do to create wows for your members whenever they contact you, whether it's in person or over the phone? All it takes is a small, tiny little action and all those little actions built upon each other together, consistently delivered are what create the wows for our members. And here's a great um, example for you. I live in Orlando, Florida. Yes, I live in the house of the mouse. <laughs> Disney World, as you can imagine, is a force to be reckoned with down here. But it's because they do so many things so well that they're internationally known all over the world. They're infamous. And as you can also imagine, the buildings, the rides, the exhibits, all the attractions are extremely expensive. In fact, they spend hundreds of millions of dollars creating those rides. I think I heard that Space Mountain itself years ago cost 150 to 200 million dollars to build. And it costs millions to maintain these rides and attractions every year as well. And yet, despite all the millions to create those big flashy wows, when they survey their guests to find out what they were most impressed with in the park, can anyone guess, think about it in your minds, what do you think is the number one thing that comes out as a wow at Disney World? Well, in the interest of time, I will tell you, it is 
the cleanliness of the park. The cleanliness of the park. They don't see any trash or paper on the ground, on the trams, in the exhibits, even in the food halls. There is no debris laying around. Now, think about that. Hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars spent creating big flashy exhibits and the simple thing of keeping the park clean is what makes the biggest impression on people overall. Of course, they're there for the rides too, but that cleanliness makes a huge difference. So think about how you can do something small. What is your cleanliness of your organization? What is your trash on the ground that you can either do or get rid of to create a wow for your members? It's a simple thing that when done well and done consistently creates that wow. And the reason we talk about those small things is because we all have a choice. Creating the wow is a matter of will. Will I or won't I? Will I or won't I do what, ex what is needed for this member at this exact moment, regardless of whether I'm tired today or oh, I really don't feel like it or nobody's ever done that for me? What is it that you can do to get yourself and everyone around you to consistently answer this question with, I will? Remember, we all have a choice. And when we all choose to consistently do it, that's when we create that wow. Consistency is key. I mean, what if you went to Disney World? Let's go back to the Disney World example for a second. And you loved it <clears throat> and were so impressed with it the first time you went that when you went back home, you had to tell everybody about it, all your family, all your friends. Oh, we've got to go back. Now you bring everybody with you. But what if the second time you went there, the park wasn't so clean anymore? Or what if some of the rides were broken or under maintenance and you couldn't even get on them? Or what if Goofy was rude to your grandchild? <gasps> Horrors. What would happen? See, because you got such a great wow the first time, that inconsistency undoes everything, undoes, undoes, undoes everything that was done the first time time because you expected that from Disney when you went back and you didn't get it the second time. So think about when you create that consistency, one act of inconsistency can undo all the good that you've done with everything that you're trying to do overall. So be consistent because if we let up, we let our members down. Not to mention what we do to the organization as a whole and to each other in the process. And one more mindset. The number one reason that customers leave, can anybody in their minds think of that as well? The number one reason is not because of the product or service. Overall, this pertains to anyone in the customer service area or even anyone in your organization, any of your members. The number one reason that customers leave an organization is not because of the product or service. Only 14% leave because of that. The number one reason customers leave or your members would leave is because of the way they were treated by someone in the organization. And by the way, this pertains to employees as well. The number one reason that employees leave is not because of the product or the service or anything about the organization, but because of the way they were treated usually by a supervisor or manager. People don't leave companies. They leave people. And members are people. So the way they're treated will determine whether or not they receive the wow we want to give them and stay or they possibly receive an owl or so many owls that they finally say, I'm leaving. So here are five quick tips to help you deliver that wow experience. And the first one is to keep your eye on the goal. Ask yourself, what is my next action going to do? What am I trying to accomplish? And will my next action move me closer to the goal or further away from it? But think about that. What is your goal? Now, we all know that we have goals of the co-op. There are goals for your location, probably goals for your team and your department, 
everyone knows what they are. You're all working together to create those hard, tangible goals. But I want to talk for a minute here about your personal goal for every interaction you have with a member or with each other. Your personal goal should be to wow every member every time. And the way that you focus on that is to ask yourself, if you ask that member right now, how do I make you feel? Then what would be their answer? Would their answer be that I make you feel better than you did when you started the call or visit? Do I make you feel worse? Or do, did I make you feel the same as when you started? Which means it's pretty much a zero-sum game. They called. They really didn't get any response that satisfied them and so they may as well not have bothered if we make them feel worse well now we're behind the game so our goal our personal goal of every interaction should be to make them feel better better than they did when they started the call or the visit this pertains to whether or not we actually can do what they're asking us to do see even if we can't do that, we can make them feel better about working with you, like make them feel so happy that they got you when they called in because you were considerate and kind and you listened to them and showed them how much they were valued, even if you couldn't say yes to what they were asking for. Make them feel better about being a member of your co-op or using the co-op services. So that is your personal goal. And when everybody has this as a personal goal, then everybody together as a team will help the co-op, the location, the team, the department reach their goals as well. And we set the stage for doing that by remembering our etiquette. And I know people say etiquette, you know, that usually pertains to dinner time, right? To table manners. Well, etiquette has much more of a broad definition than just pertaining to the dinner table. In fact, the classic definition of etiquette is the customary code of polite behavior in society or among members of a particular profession or group. So it pertains to your culture, your ethics, your morals. What is your philosophy? What are you trying to do as a group? And how are you going to behave towards each other and your members to accomplish those goals and to create that culture? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about etiquette. And so the first thing I want to talk about is the fact that there are many, many pieces of etiquette. There are some basic ones, and we'll just kind of touch on them right now so that you know, yeah, I know what the basics of etiquette are, such as telephone etiquette. You never let your phone ring more than three times, right? And if you can do it less than that, that's wonderful. I don't know what your particular policies are, but many organizations have this as a general rule. No more than three rings, otherwise that member is going to hang up or get really frustrated. Same thing with personal interactions versus on the computer. When we come out of our digital world and we see each other face to face, when someone is standing in front of you, you don't even want to let 30 seconds go by before you at least acknowledge them. Even if you're on the phone or you're talking to someone, glance over at them. Give them eye contact. Hold up your index finger to show them you'll be with them in a second if you can't address them right away. But next time you're in front of somebody, wait 30 seconds with neither of you saying anything and see just how long 30 seconds really is. And then in the digital world, when we're doing emails and other digital communications, don't be using the texting shortcuts. We all know that because not everybody knows them. But I want to go beyond these basics to the mindsets and the habits that you can form that will help you consistently create wows for your people. And the first one is to give your name and ask how you can help the member. Anytime you're on the phone and even, you know, if you're at your desk and someone walks up to you, have a name plaque or something there or a name tag. If you don't have anything indicating your name, you can always even just say to them, hi, I'm Sandy. How may I help you? So what is your standard greeting? You know, I call my doctor's office, my primary care physician's office quite frequently because for a while my parents were living with me and they were very ill. Before they passed, they were living with us. And I was talking to the doctor's office constantly. Well, they have three people who answer the phone. 
And because of all the different things that were going on, I needed to know who I was talking about. And I never knew. I had to actually ask them every time, and who am I speaking with today? And then they would give me their name. They finally, one of them, finally caught on. And she tells me her name. And I hear her doing that with other people. So she's caught on that. Oh, people don't really want to talk to a nameless, faceless person. They want at least a name to put with the voice. Do you enjoy calling and not knowing anything about who you're talking to? No. So if you put yourself in your member's shoes, just remember to always, always use your name in your greeting so that they know who you are. And always give your member your full attention. Now, I know that sounds self-evident, right? And we always try to do that. But believe me, distractions are everywhere. And you know this to be true. In fact, there's a funny thing called FOMO. F-O-M-O. -O. Have you ever heard of that, FOMO? It's the fear of missing out. <laughs> and people do this all the time at parties. You know, they come up to you, they're shaking your hand and saying, hey, so nice to see you. But their eyes are everywhere else looking all around. Who else is there? What's going on? Why are they laughing over there? And they're completely distracted. And you don't even know if they've heard a word that you've said until they open their mouths and then ask you, huh, what? <laughs> so... Give your member your full attention. In fact, stop completely what you were doing before they came. And if you have papers on the desk, flip them over because your eyes will be tempted to go back down to those papers even just for a second. But it could be the one second that that member asked you an important question. And now you're the one having to come back and say, huh, what? I missed that. Sorry. Can you repeat that question? When that happens, especially if it's on the phone, they don't know how long you haven't been paying attention. All it sounds like to them is that you're not paying attention, period. Not just that you were distracted by a second. So stop what you're doing. Turn things over. Give your member your full attention. In fact, recently, I did an informal survey of people to ask, what are these subtle signs of disrespect? And 93% of the people came back with this one answer in one form or another. 93% of the people said that the biggest subtle sign of disrespect is not being fully present when someone is talking to you. Exactly what we were talking about. You're looking around, you're looking on your phone, you're texting, you're doing other things. Stop that. Give your member your full attention and stop showing them the subtle signs of disrespect by not being fully present for them. And what I mentioned a minute ago, look for ways to wow them even when the answer is no. We all know that we can't always do exactly what the member asks, but rather than saying a complete no, can we look for maybe a partial yes? Is there a compromise that we can do? Is there something that we can give them for their inconvenience? You'll have to check with the policies, the customer service and service recovery policies of your particular co-op to find out what you're allowed to do to wow a member, even if you can't say yes, or even if you can, can you give them a little extra something? You know, I speak a lot down in New Orleans, and the Cajuns have a saying down there, and it's called lanyap, L-A-G-N-I-E-P-P-E. -P -P -E. And what lanyap means is a little something extra. So is there a little lanyap you can give them, even if you do say yes? Can you just go over and above and give them that extra something? But even if you can't give them any kind of yes, remember what I said before about your personal goal. And it is a maybe a terrible statement on society that nowadays, just giving people our attention and showing them that they're valued, appreciated, and that we're actually listening to what they're saying can be the biggest gift that you give them even when the answer is no. They will appreciate the fact that you took your time, you tried to help them, you did everything you could, and believe me, even when you give the yes, the way you treat them will stay with them much longer than whether or not they actually got what they called in for. So always act according to your values. I wanna share a little story with you about someone who did this, did something for me years back, but I will never forget what he did because of how he did it. He didn't do it because he was asked to, and it wasn't even just because he was paid to do it, but it was simply because of who he 
was. I was in Chicago for a speaking engagement when my back went out, and I mean out, as I tried to pick myself off, up off the floor in front of the hotel elevators, hotel management was rushing toward me saying, we have to call 911. I laid on the floor and I said, 911, uh, don't call 911. I'm not going to a hospital. I have a speaking engagement. And they're like, um, speaking engagement? You can't even get up. How are you going to speak? Well, I don't know, but just please, please help me up and out to the car that's waiting for me outside and I'll handle it one step at a time. But whatever you do, don't call 911. So they called 911 <laughs> and I literally became the property of the Lake Forest, Illinois Fire and Rescue and Police Departments, basically having to sign away my rights and my life in an effort to convince them that I would not be suing them when this was all over. I mean, that's our society now, right? We have to protect ourselves. So once I signed everything in triplicate, I did manage to get to my feet stay on my feet for the next three hours to do my program and then get myself to the airport for the ride home. But by the time I got there, I was physically, mentally, and emotionally exhausted. I could barely walk, almost couldn't breathe, and was about at the end of my rope when I began the long trek to my gate at that tiny little airport known as O'Hare. <laughs> yeah, you might be chuckling right now, that tiny little airport huge. Well, on my third step, I felt that sickeningly familiar feeling that told me my back and legs were about to give out yet again. But as I started to go down, two good Samaritans rushed up behind me and grabbed me under each arm to keep me from falling. And upon hearing my plight and my pain, one of them said, we need to call 911. No, no, do not call 911, whatever you do. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. I just need to get home. And as we tried to figure out what to do, suddenly one of my helpers said, oh, Look, straight across from us, sitting there as if idle, was one of those airline travel carts, you know, that goes from gate to gate. And the driver was sitting there, noticed us, came straight up to us, inquired about the problem. When my helpers told him what it was, he came right up to me, asked me my name. And when I told him, he said, hi, Sandy, my name is Victor. I'm going to help you get home. Everything will be all right. <sighs> and for the first time since crumpling into a puddled mass that morning in front of the hotel elevators, I actually began to believe that it would be. You know, Victor was a guardian angel sent to help me because he did something that most drivers would not do. Here's what he did. He got me onto that cart and got me onto that gate out to my gate. But what normally happens in that case? Well, he drops you off at the gate and then er, er, he's on his way, right? Get out of my way. I'm on to the next customer. But he did not do that. He saw how much pain and agony I was in and that I was all alone. And he stayed with me for an hour and a half to keep me company. And also just in case, because you never know, when the gate for any particular flight is going to be changed, right? Which mine was, if he had ever dumped me off there, I don't know if I could have gotten to my new gate in time, but he took me to my new gate. And then when we got there, he called for a narrow airplane aisle chair to help me get down the aisle of the airplane in case I needed help getting to my seat. I didn't even know those things existed, but he did. And he helped me get it. And then he went one step further and he called ahead to Orlando to arrange for a wheelchair on the other side. Ha! Huh, I hadn't even thought that far ahead yet. I couldn't. I was just trying to get from one minute to the next. But Victor thought ahead for me. And as he compassionately and caringly took care of everything I needed, not only at that moment, but all the way through my trip to Orlando, I looked up at him and I said, thank you, Victor, for making me feel so safe and so secure. You're my guardian angel. 
To which Victor replied, well, that's the way my mama raised me. <gasps> that said it all, didn't it? In one sentence, Victor showed me his values and he demonstrated those values to everyone he met, even a perfect stranger. And while you may say that Victor's job enta entailed helping everyone he meets, even a perfect stranger, Victor's values dictated the way he did that job. And that's really the most important point, isn't it? How we do our jobs, how we live our lives. We don't want to just go from point A to point B. We want to show people our values with every interaction. So how do we translate our values into action and create more victors and fewer victims? Well, I've created a little template for you. I call it the one, two, threes of doing more than a piece. And it's based on three questions you can ask yourself in any given situation. The first one is, what can I do now? Now, this is the question that every customer service person asks and answers, even if it's just in an effort to appease the member, right? But when they do that number one thing, they usually consider their job done and, oh, let's go on to the next thing. Victor didn't do that. So he asked, what can I do now? And he got me to my gate. Normal customer service rep in that position, normal driver would have just left me. But Victor went on to question number two. What else can I do now? Well, I can stay here with her. I can keep her company. I can make sure if her gate changes, I can get her to the next gate. So he asked question number two and did something about it. And then even when we got to the new gate, he asked it again. What else can I do now? He got me that airplane aisle chair to get me to my seat on the plane. But then Victor did naturally Step number three, which is what else can I do later or for later? He called ahead to Orlando and arranged for a wheelchair on the other side. One, two, three. He did way more than appease me. So can you use this simple formula to proactively and compassionately think on behalf of your member when they call in with a problem, they may not even know what they need or they may not know all the things they need. Can you proactively and critically think about, hmm, if they do this, they're going to need A, B, and C, and they don't even know about C just yet, but I'm going to offer it and let them know I know my job, and I'm going to figure out what I can do now, what else I can do now, and what else I can do later or for later. You know, when I got to Orlando, I was reminded all over again, of Victor's compassion and his wonderful human nature. And I thank the Lord for putting him in my path in Chicago and helping me even when I got to Orlando. Use this template to create wow experiences that last for your members too. And here's a big one. Don't act as though you or your co-op or any of its employees could never make a mistake. Have you ever had this happen? You call up because something went wrong. Someone told you the wrong thing. You acted on that knowledge, but they didn't know what they were talking about. But they convinced you that they did. This is one of my biggest pet peeves because when I call up because someone has steered me wrong from the organization, what do I hear? Well, who said that? Or he or she would never have said that. You know, they've been here long enough. They know better. You must have misunderstood. You know, folks, if I must have misunderstood all the things that people lately are telling me I must have misunderstood, I wouldn't be able to tie my own shoes. I'd be laying in a puddle of drool because I wouldn't be able to do anything. I am not always wrong as the customer. Your members are not either. We're all human. We all can misspeak. But do not say these kind of things. And then when I hear, trust me, oh. I want to run screaming in the other direction because sometimes that's the worst offender. Trust me, I've been here forever. Case in point, uh, yeah, several years back, I went to Home Depot. I wanted to buy some flooring and I wanted to buy some countertops, and which we did. Now, there was a flyer and a big promotion going on, and one of them had a six-month no-interest payment plan. The other one had a one-year no-interest 
payment plan. So when I get up to the register, I am all prepared. I'm fine with paying one of them on six months and one of them on one year. But the gentleman who gets up to the, tries to cash me out, says, oh, you know that both of these can go under the one year no interest plan. And I'm showing him the flyer saying, well, that's clearly not what it says here. This is fine the way it is. He said, no, no, no. I've worked here a long time. Trust me. All of it qualifies for one year. Well, <laughs> I've been burned enough times with the trust me that I said to him, really? Would you put that in writing? <laughs> he looked at me like I was crazy and said, you want it in writing? Yes, I do. Do you mind? So he wrote on the paper that I had that this, all of it was due in the, you know, qualifies for the one year, signed his name, dated it. I cashed out, went on my merry way. Wow, that's great. Two weeks later, ring, ring, ring. Here's Home Depot on the phone telling me, Mrs. Giroux, oh my goodness, we're so sorry, but someone put the, you know, whatever the other one was under the one-year plan, and that only has a six-month no interest plan. I said, really? I was told that they all qualified, and they said, no, no, no. Uh, who said that? And I told them, I don't know, David, somebody, I don't know. And I said, that's who told me that I showed him the flyer, and he said it all qualified. Oh, no, no. He's been here a long time. He would never have said that. You must have misunderstood. Oh, my favorite words, right? So I waited a second before dropping the bomb. And I said, really? I have it in writing. Dead silence. And then um, you have it in writing? Yes, I do. Uh, would you mind bringing that down? I'll be right there. <laughs> I went down to their credit. They did honor the one year, no interest for everything, because that's what I had been told. But what would have happened if I hadn't gotten it in writing? I would have paid the price. I would have been told I'd made a mistake. He never would have said that. See, we don't know everything that everybody is saying or miss saying. So please be careful. Give your member the benefit of the doubt and say, well, Okay, I'm not sure where the misunderstanding came came in, but here's what the real story is and try to explain it to them. Try not to blame either them, don't point fingers at them, or to your yourself, your colleagues, your organization, your member. Try not to do that. If a member did do something wrong, point it out tactfully, if at all. If you don't have to point it out, don't. It has to be really obvious or there's no other way to show that the co-op did nothing wrong before you say, well, I'm sorry, but it seems that there was a misunderstanding. I'm not sure if you misunderstood. Maybe somebody else misspoke. But here's what it is. Be very, very careful about blaming. And I just love this quote. I had an interview one time with Judge Mathis from the TV. And he has the TV show, but he also was doing a radio show for a while. And I did a radio interview with him. And he said this. It was really great. He said, remember that when you point your finger, there are three more fingers pointing right back at you. So be careful about pointing fingers and laying blame. In fact, try not to do it at all. Just focus forward on the solutions. Don't focus backward on the problem or on blame or pointing fingers. Just, okay, here's what happened. Well, let's see how we go forward from here. Let's see how we can fix that and correct that for you. Okay? So just remember that. And here is a huge thing. Use the magic phrase. And the magic phrase is, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that that happened to you. I'm so sorry those things broken, broke down. You see, you're not saying you're sorry because you did something wrong. But think about it. When you call someone because something has gone wrong, you call an organization, what is it that you want to hear most of all, first of all? I'm sorry. You want an apology for that happening to you. And you're not completely wowed or satisfied unless someone from the organization gives it to you. So even if they cor correct the situation, you still want to hear the, I apologize for that. Now let's correct it. So remember that magic phrase. I'm so sorry that happened. Now let's move forward and fix it. And tell the truth. If you don't exactly know, be careful that you don't overpromise. You don't exaggerate what can be done. Don't guess by any means. If you don't know an answer, don't be afraid to tell them. I would much rather, as a member, have you even go away for an hour, two hours, call me back a day, whatever, and give me the right answer than tell me something that's wrong 
and then have the problem be compounded. Even if the problem isn't compounded, my attitude toward the co-op now is compounded because first I had the problem, then you didn't know, then or you didn't give me the right answer, then I had to call back and get the second thing corrected. So be very careful. Don't be afraid to say, you know, I'm not 100% sure, and I don't want to give you the wrong information. So let me get back to you. Or can you hold for a moment while I double check my information? All you have to do. And remember that the sweetest sound anybody can ever hear is their own name. So yes, you're giving your name, but also find out what theirs is and use it. But don't overuse it. Sometimes we we look at those things and we may have a script in front of us, right? And we say, oh, hi, Mrs. Giroux. It's a wonderful day, Mrs. Giroux. And I see that you did this, Mrs. Giroux. And Mrs. Giroux, oh my goodness, they sound like a robot just repeating my name over and over and over again. So be careful about overusing the name. Refer to your paperwork or your computer screen. Find out what it is. Ask them how to pronounce it and pay attention to that. And then even say it back so that they know what you're listening, right? And then use it sparingly, but use it. You know, I have people that ask me my name and I'll say, you know, Sandy Giroux or Mrs. Giroux, or they'll say it wrong and I'll tell them how to say it right. And the next time it comes out of their mouth, it's wrong again. And it's like, you weren't even listening. Why are you asking if you're not gonna listen? So use it, find out how to pronounce it. Don't slough out of it. Say it a couple of times if you need to, and let them know you care enough about them to use their name properly, and then do that. Just remember the member is not the enemy, even though sometimes it can get contentious when things go wrong, especially if a, a phone call or a, an in-person visit is going south. Try to keep cool. Try to remember that they're not the enemy, and think about what would you do for a friend who had a problem. You'd listen to them, you'd commiserate, you'd smile, you'd try to help them, you'd do whatever you can to make them feel better. That's what we need to do for our members. And last thing on etiquette is don't hang up first. What if they think of one more thing and they start to say, oh, I forgot to ask you, click, they're gone. Let them hang up first and then you hang up afterwards. Remember, I love this quote too. Every job is a self-portrait of the person who did it. So autograph your work with excellence. Now, next thing is to listen carefully and actively. Active listening is a whole topic unto itself, so we won't go into it extensively here, but it entails listening carefully, feeding back the answers to confirm that you're understanding, making sounds of confirmation or affirmation every once in a while, nodding, smiling, things like that if you're in person. But what I want to focus on right here is you're listening for what's being said, but I also want you to listen for what's not being said. Sometimes you can feel it, can't you? When your member is talking about something and you say, oh, there's more to this story that I just don't know, ask them. For example, one of my customer service clients was a relocation company and one of their reps got a guy on the phone who they were having a last minute move to a new home he calls the rep up and starts demanding, I want this truck there on Friday. I don't care what you say, you get it there on Friday. I'm taking the day off and my wife is going to be with me and we had better have that truck there. Well, because of the rules of the road, you can't have a driver driving too long. It was completely physically impossible for them to get there, the truck there on, on Friday, but it was possible Saturday. So the rep hands it to the manager who then says, sir, you know, we really can't get that truck there on Friday. She asks the magic question about what's not being said, right? She says, sir, why is it so important that the truck get there on Friday? Do you have something on the truck, like some important medicine or something in there that we need to try to get to and get for you? but we physically cannot have the truck there. <laughs> you won't believe what the guy said. The guy says, no, my wife just wants to move into that house on Friday and she's telling me I better take that day off and we're gonna move in that day. Oh, so your wife's calling the shots. That's what the problem was. He was so intimidated by his wife, she was badgering into him into badgering the company to do something was completely impossible. So 
The customer service manager said, sir, we really can't get the truck there on Friday, but tell me, what's your favorite restaurant around this area? And he told her, and uh, she said, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to suggest that you do not take Friday off for no reason from work. Don't waste a vacation day when you can't do anything. But we're going to send you a $50 gift card for that restaurant. Please take your wife out and have maybe a nice cocktail or a soft drink, whatever you want to have, and an appetizer on us. Have a nice dinner and then get ready for your move on Saturday when I guarantee the truck will be there. Boom. For 50 bucks. They salvaged a $7,000 move and all the referrals, all the repeat business that will come from it for 50 bucks because the manager asked about what was not being said. So think about that. If something's jangling at you and you know there's more to that story, start asking, why is it so important that we do that? What can I do for you to help that situation? Find out what's not being said and just let them talk. Sometimes they just need to vent. Don't interrupt them. Don't take it personally. You didn't do anything wrong. And don't assume whatever you do that you know, <clears throat> pardon me, that you know what they want you to do. See, when you assume you could cause more problems than you would if you just wait and ask them, what would you like us to do? For example, there is an example right from one of your co-ops where an angry member called up because his bill was so high. But thankfully, he got an experienced representative on the phone who instead of assuming like what we all would, right? What's the first thing that jumps to your mind that he's going to ask for when the bill is so high? Knock off some of this fee, right? I, want, I don't want to pay that much. But she refrained from the assumption and said, um, I'm sorry that the bill is so high, sir. What would you like us to do? What would you like to see happen, basically? And he surprisingly came out with, well, I want somebody to come out here and check my meter and make sure it's working okay. <laughs> Whoa, yes, yay, we can do that. Yes, sir, we'd be happy to send someone out to your home. I mean, if she had assumed and just been ready for a fight, she would have caused the fight by assuming that's what he wanted. Never assume. When it comes to that, but here's one thing I do want you to assume. I want you to assume that the person on the phone or in front of you are, is not trying to be difficult. Have you ever thought to yourself when someone is treating you like you're making something up? Have you ever thought to yourself, what, do you think I have time to just sit around here all day and think of ways to aggravate you? <laughs> I know I have. So don't let your members think that either. They're not trying to be difficult. There's simply someone in a difficult situation who's trying to get a problem resolved. And here's a big one. Don't bring prior baggage to new interactions. Now that's prior baggage with the same person or that's prior baggage with one person that you bring to an interaction with a new person. I want you to remember this Latin phrase, tabula rasa, which means blank slate. Look at everyone as if they were a blank slate coming to you with the best of intentions. And let me give you another quick story to illustrate why this is so important. I was um, out for a speaking engagement one day. I had rented a car, and on the morning I needed to bring the car back, I had a migraine headache to beat the band. I barely got myself back there. I handed the car over, lugged my bags up to the counter, waited 15 minutes to get waited on so I could check out and go to the airport, only to hear the person at the counter say, oh, I see that you didn't fill the car up with gas. Oh, oh. nope, forgot to do it. So now I have the very pleasant choice of either going back down, getting the car back and filling it up or paying a $40 convenience fee for them to fill it. Yeah, whose convenience is that? Plus over $10 a gallon for the gas. Well, ever vigilant for my own and my client's finances, I dragged my bags back down, saw the girl who took the car and I said, oh, I need the car back because I forgot to put gas in it. I have such a headache, I forgot. And she said to me, oh no. She said, I, I saw that. And I almost said something to you, but I didn't because so many people have come to me lately. And when I try to say anything helpful to them, they start yelling at me and getting in my face, even using the F word on me, telling me to stay out of their business. They know what they're doing. So she said, when I saw that you hadn't filled the car up with gas, I said, you know what? Forget it. That's her problem. 
She said, I am so sorry. I should have said something. You see, she knew what the right thing to do was, and she almost did it. But she let other people's bad behavior influence what she did. You know what? Don't let anybody influence your acting according to your values. Treat everyone as if they're coming to you with the best of intentions. And if they behave badly in response, oh, well, that's their problem, not yours. You can look yourself in the eye every morning. You can look in the mirror and say, I'm doing the best job I can in treating everybody the way I want to. I'm always the person I want to be. So tabula rasa with every new interaction. And just get control of your emotions. When you spiral out of control, you spiral the member out of control with you. And, you know, sometimes this happens with our colleagues, too. And sometimes it even happens with family members where we kind of take them for granted because we know that they care about us and they love us. And so sometimes it's easier to lose our temper with them. Just be really careful you're not losing your temper. Get control of your emotions as much as possible by summoning, em summoning as much empathy as you possibly can. Now, I know we all think we're empathetic, but if we truly put ourselves in their shoes and start to try to think of what are they feeling at this moment, how would I feel if that was happening to me? Stop for a moment and summon more empathy than you think you're already summoning, and you can put yourself in their shoes and truly treat them the way you would like to be treated. It'll help you look at the event objectively, too. They're not yelling at you. You didn't do anything wrong. And basically, what are you there for? What does it have to do with you? Well, you're there to help them solve a problem and feel better. So what happens when someone does behave badly? Well, first of all, let's look at what is rude behavior. Simply raising a voice does not necessarily designate rude behavior. I mean, I'm Italian. I'm 100% Italian. My, my married name is Giroux, but my maiden name is Petorelli, and that is 100% Italian. We're loud. We're boisterous. We raise our voices when we're happy, when we're sad, when we're passionate about something. It doesn't matter. We're not trying to be rude, but that's what happens. When, when we just see something that really strikes us, our voices get louder. It's not rude. So try to think. Don't put your... Um, interpretation on their actions just because that's not the way you would behave. So look at it and say, is it really rude? Now, if it is, well, then you have to de-escalate the situation because you don't want it to spiral out of control. And there are several steps that will help you focus on de-escalating that situation. One is calming response number one, the magic phrase, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Sometimes that's all they need and now they're calmed down and they can talk reasonably. If they don't, then you go to the second one, which is very often to just ignore the snipe they just sent at you. You don't need to respond to every snipe that they throw your way. Or you can say an orienting phrase, which is telling them basically what you're going to do before you do it. Don't just put them on hold. Say, I'm going to put you on hold for a moment so I can go check on that. Or just let me check on your record. Things like that. Use an orienting phrase or just ignore a snipe. Now, the third one is a diplomatic request for a ceasefire. Please allow me to check into this. I can't really do anything until I check into this. So just let me do that and I'll be right back with you. And then, you know, maybe put them on hold so that you have time to calm down and so do they. Now, if that still doesn't work, of course, you're going to have to go to your co-op's policies on this. So the basic gist of it is you can either tell them you're going to have to hang up or stop the in-person conversation, or you're going to have to call your supervisor or manager if they don't stop. Um, and that, you know, it, we, we know you're upset, but please, I need to call my manager or, in fact, offer. Would you like to call, talk to my manager or supervisor and see what you can do? And then the fifth one is to actually hang up or call the supervisor or manager or whatever it is. But if you focus on a little five-step system, it will help you. Okay, now I'm in phase one. It's easy. Phase two is a little more difficult. But it helps you also back away from the emotions when you're in that situation. So de-escalate the situation step by step. And the last thing is just be gracious. I mean, people don't always behave the way they want to behave when they're angry and upset. And they don't really mean to take it out on you, 
but they do because you're there. But if they recognize that they're behaving badly and they try to apologize to you, let them. Let them save face. They feel badly enough as it is that they've lost control of their emotions. But if you just commiserate with them, oh, don't worry, we've all had bad days. Or, hey, sometimes I miss those things too if they've missed an important thing that's caused the problem. Or I've had that happen to me also. Please allow them to save face. Because sometimes the best gift that you can give to anybody at all is the unexpected gift of grace when things go wrong. People are beating themselves up. People are beating each other up verbally. I mean, there is so much incivility in the world right now that nobody expects to have anybody give them a little bit of graciousness when something goes wrong. You can be that person to give them the unexpected gift of grace, even when they've done something wrong. And just remember, it all works if we care about each other and show it. Now, I hope you can see the little kitty cat who's underneath that dog who's sitting on the cat. I just love that picture. Well, that's how we show we care. Oh, brother. Just remember, we do have to care about each other and show it. If you care but don't show it, it's not really worth it. They don't know. And I love this quote because it goes right back to the 212 movie and all the things I said about the little things that we do. Sometimes when I consider what tremendous consequences come from little things, I'm tempted to think there are no little things. And he's right. There are no little things because one little thing that may mean nothing to you may mean the world to someone in need of that particular action at that particular moment like when Victor helped me at that airport in Chicago. So think about the little things that you can do that together as a team add up to a huge wow experience for every member who interacts with you. Now in your handout, you also have an action plan because all this information, hopefully you've gotten some ideas and I've sparked your creativity with some of this. All of it is great, but all of it is completely useless if you don't do anything with it. And don't get overwhelmed with, oh, there was a bunch of information. Just think about one thing, one thing you can focus on this week that will improve and help you create a wow experience for your even your toughest members. What actions will you take? What results are you going to expect of yourself so you know if you're succeeding? What's your goal? Okay, so think about that one thing, write it down, and keep it in front of you so you can focus on doing that one thing this week. Now, we're just about ready to wrap up. And what I want to say is that we have some more information that is um, coming. We have more webinars and some information. Maggie Gallant has joined us on the call. So happy to see you, Maggie. I'm going to unmute you in just a moment. But what I want to do is make sure that if you want to hear about the things that are coming up, please stay on the webinar for a couple more minutes. We promise we won't keep you past uh, 11 or maybe just a couple minutes past that, but it'll be very short if you want to hear about uh, TEC's upcoming webinars and events. So as I leave all of you, and the, if the rest of you have to leave after this, that's fine. I want to leave you with this. We can create wow experiences for everyone we interact with. Members, colleagues, coworkers, family members, community members alike. It may not be easy, but keep this in mind. There are always two choices, two paths to take. One is easy. And its only reward is that it's easy. Do we really want to do things because they're easy? Or do we want to do things because they're worth it? It is so worth it to create the wow experiences that will make you feel good as a person and make your member feel good as a member of your co-op. Thank you for being here with me today. Now go forth and wow. And now I am going to get Maggie on the line. I saw that you came in. Thank you so much, Maggie. And I am going to unmute you. I just have to find you in the list. Maggie, can you unmute? I think you might be muted yourself. There we go. Here you go. All right. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much, you. everyone. Thank you, Sandy. I uh, hope everybody enjoyed that, found value uh, with it. Um, I'm not going to take very long, as Sandy said. Uh, just a couple of important things. 
there is um, an email that's been sent to everybody that registered with a link to the evaluation survey. Please fill that out. Tell us whether this was valuable, applicable to your role. Um, tell us ideas you have for future webinars. If there's something that Sandy talked about but wasn't able to go into a lot of detail on because we covered a lot, put that into the um, anything else you'd like to tell us section. And we'll use that because we are looking to schedule more webinars, as uh, Sandy already said. Uh, we're particularly going to look at some of the, uh, go into a bit more detail about conflict, how you deal with some of those difficult interactions, whether by a phone or in person. So Sandy will dig a little bit deeper into that. Um, you know, maybe even be able to do some role play um, over the phone. So lots of options there. So please use that survey. If you didn't get a link to the survey, just send an email to me or to uh, the training email. Just give us whatever feedback you have. Um, also, just to let you know, Tuesday, May the 14th, we have another webinar with Sandy. So if you like Sandy's style, and I know a lot of us do, um, this one's going to be eight things you should never do as a leader. So this is whether you're a new leader, an experienced leader, or somebody that's looking to move into a leadership position. Sandy's going to tell you those things that you should not be doing. So if you are doing them, <laughs> you'll know to stop them. And if you're not doing them yet, or you're not yet a leader, then you'll know um, how, to, uh, how to prevent falling into uh, some of those situations. So that's Tuesday, May the 14th at 10 o'clock, eight things you should never do as a leader, and you can find that on the TEC website. And then the only other thing is to talk to you about our core program. This is where we bring instructors to you on site, more in-depth workshops that could be everything from a, from a four hour to a full day to a day and a half. On the screen right now, you're seeing some of the other options that Sandy's offering uh, on the customer service area. You can build your own program. So a lot of those topics can be built in two hour blocks. So you could put together your own program, bring Sandy on site and do some training with all of your customer service teams. And we'll also be reaching out to some of you uh, with training facilities to see if we might schedule Sandy for a workshop and then invite some of your neighboring co-ops into. So lots of options there. We'll send this uh, one pager out to you all so that you have a copy of this. But most importantly, just give us your feedback. Tell us what was valuable here and what else you'd like to see. So thank you so much, Sandy. Thank you everybody for joining the call and I'll let you close this out. All right, thank you so much. Yes, and Maggie uh, had a great point. You know, we can only do so much on a webinar, especially when we're getting into difficult situations, role-playing, uh, dialogues that we can have, scripting, uh, service and service recovery policies and things like that specific to your location. So those things, if you do want something that's in person where we can dive into that and everyone can contribute, that is an awesome experience for everybody because then you bring your specific situations there so I'd love to see all of you uh, in the future either on a webinar or in person thank you so much again for being here and we'll close this out the recording will be available we have one from yesterday I'll chat with Maggie about whether we want to put both up or we just want to put one but I've got it recording just in case and you'll be able to review that with the link that Maggie can send you so thanks again for being here, and everybody have a wonderful day, a wonderful weekend, and if you celebrate Easter, happy Easter. Bye now.